I'm Caroline Hyde, this is Bloomberg Technology, and we're live from Boston this week, showcasing the innovation, diversity, and power of the regional tech economy. Coming up in the next hour, Boston has become a standout city for testing self-driving cars, and we are at Optimus Rides indoor track, getting a look behind the scenes, and we'll speak with the CEO, Ryan Chin. Plus, as the pace of autonomous driving technology moves rapidly, how are companies factoring in safety? We'll hear from someone on the forefront of this work, John Leonard of the Toyota Research Institute. And our exclusive interview with Raytheon CEO Tom Kennedy, explaining why Boston remains one of the best pools of talent in the world. First to our top story, in the race for autonomous vehicle supremacy, Boston is one of the handful of U.S. cities leading the charge to test self-driving cars. In 2017, the city launched a testing program of autonomous cars on public roads within the Seaport District. That's where Lyft's first self-driving car pilot kicked off last December, and startup Optimus Ride recently relocated its headquarters. Bloomberg's Anne Mostu got an inside look at the indoor track here at Optimus Ride. This self-driving vehicle startup is on a roll. The company is Optimus Ride, a play on the Transformers robots. And it's located in Boston's seaport. Its small fleet of test vehicles is navigating an indoor city. This is our test track, our indoor test track. We call it Optimus City because it's the size of several city blocks. Uh, we're able to reconfigure the track by changing the lane markers. We can configure this to any type of intersection that we want. You know, five-way complicated Boston intersection, mm -hmm. a typical four-way intersection with stop signs. CEO and co-founder Ryan Chin says Optimus Ride is different from other startups in that they're not focused on long distance, but on the last mile of transportation. Right now, they're testing at Union Point, a nearby housing development, driving residents to the local train station. This is different from companies such as Uber, which are testing autonomous driving for longer trips. The recent pedestrian death in Arizona shut down testing in Boston, but just for a day. Optimus Ride restarted after safety reviews. There is a goal of educating the public. Whenever you have a new technology, you have to educate the public. We believe if you start in a, I would say, medium speed environment, a vehicle that's going 20, 30 miles per hour, it's much better than going to a high speed vehicle that's autonomous as well. So adoption has to start at those kind of speed regimes. This MIT spin-off has about 60 employees and Chin expects to grow to 150 by mid-2019. They plan to expand their fleet of electric vehicles to 50 by the end of this year. We also expect the growth to be non-linear, especially around engineering, uh, in ro in the, specifically in the areas of robotics, computer vision, machine intelligence. With more than $23 million from investors, Optimus Ride is searching for more partners. We have many partners already, and we're actually adding more partners as we go. Right? So one of the big partners that we have is NVIDIA. NVIDIA is an investor in our company as well as a partner. Uh, they make the top GPUs for self-driving, so they're a great partner for us. They build all the computers that go into to our our vehicles to process all that information. We have other partnerships with uh, the Perkins School for the Blind here in Watertown, Massachusetts. They're a big advocacy group for equitable mobility. Optimus Ride plans to remain private. The biggest challenge will be competition with the giants in the race to release self-driving cars. Not just manufacturers like Volkswagen and Hyundai, but also Google and Mastu Bloomberg, Boston. And joining us now for more is Ryan Chin, CEO of Optimus Ride. We were just hearing their competitions on, Ryan. Who's going to be first to actually make money with this? Where in the food chain do you sit? We fit 
right away, right? We are already deploying, right? As, as you see in the video, we are deploying at Union Point uh, here in, in Massachusetts. We believe it's actually the world's first revenue generating pilot, which provides us validation not only in technology, but also in markets, right? We're deploying, they're moving people autonomously on the site, you know, providing a service to a client. And that's really important for validating that market. And for us, that market segment itself being able to deploy in these medium speed medium environments where we can provide and sol solve the first and last mile is a real problem that almost all cities have the problem that all cities have that the governments are having to invest in better infrastructure for making the congestion ease but they're investing billions should governments be investing more into this part of the food chain to to make autonomous cars more of a reality because at the moment it's a lot of private money going into it. Yeah, well, there, historically governments have, like you look at the U.S. government, they gave a lot of uh, funding through DARPA in the early days uh, for the original testing uh, and development of autonomous vehicles. This is you know literally hundreds of millions of dollars ten years ago, and then industry sort of t took those ideas and sort of ran with it. But we need continual investment, not just in terms of research, but also infrastructure and what are the right policies that enable autonomous vehicles vehicles to be deployed, right? There are different policies in different states. How do you actually get uniformity across that? We've seen some countries, like for example Singapore, push very hard for this, and that's where you know governments can actually play a big role as to how do you pro provide an environment or a framework for autonomous vehicles to actually be commercialized. Would this be a better economic bet than putting billions into trains and, and would it be better to put it into the, the belief that we have uh, as a company is that self-driving is the key disruptive technology technology for the 21st century. If you're able to deploy autonomous vehicles, you solve many, many problems. You solve a lot of the carbon emissions problems. You solve the congestion problem. You solve a lot of the other issues of too much parking in cities. By enabling shared autonomous electric you know, economy to happen, those are the things that you're able to actually do right away once you have that system working. You talked about infrastructure needs and also regulatory harmonization. Are they the two key roadblocks to seeing more revenue generating pilots that we've already got shown by you? I don't think so, actually. The way that you can deploy now, you can actually do it, right? You can deploy in these locations like we have already by working with the right kind of groups. And in fact, when you have those in place, you actually create a showcase. Mm. for your regulators to actually come and see, well, we have a system that actually works here in South Weymouth, Massachusetts. You can come and see the system work. And that actually lubricates, in a way, the, the environment for you to actually be, begin to deploy in other locations. How much of a setback was the death that we saw in Arizona with the Uber yeah. uh, car? And, and has it put, obviously, you had to stop for a day or so, but how much harder is it to win hearts and minds, do you think? I don't think it, I mean, a day or two is not a big deal, you know, yeah. to, to, to not be testing. Obviously, we we had talked to the city. We've talked to the state about our testing regulation, our testing regime, how we create lots of level, levels of redundancy. We have two test operators on the vehicle. Also, we talked to them a lot about how we recruit and t train our drivers and all that. That was very uh, important for setting the stage on what we actually do in terms of functional safety. Mm. And then once you have that put in place, people feel confident about that. But the other key part is education. Right? Yeah. How do you educate? How do you get people to adopt? We feel that the best way to adopt is to deploy through pilots. Once you test and deploy and be able to get actual users they, and they feel that the system works well and is solving a problem for them, then that spreads. And that's really the in sort of a build it, they'll come kind of attitude around deployment. Where are you taking the revenue cut? Sorry? Where are yeah. you taking the revenue cut? How are you being yeah. paid for yeah. the software that you're building? Yeah, so what we do is uh, provide mobility as a service, right? So the client, in this case, you know, the developer of Union Point, is basically providing an amenity, a self-driving mobility amenity, to all the tenants of that development. And so the passengers don't pay, but the client, you know, it does as an amenity. If you were to go to any university campus, you don't actually pay for the shuttle. <laughs> Students mm. don't pay for it, but the university does. So you're providing a kind of B2B model, you know, for self driving and that's really been starting to validate itself through the number of clients that we're already you know either deploying or already starting to uh, to negotiate with you're working with partners what other partners would you want to work with you already said Nvidia they're, they're providing the chips but, but who eventually makes the most money out of this because everyone's yeah. gonna be fighting for the data the car companies want the data the yeah. tech companies want the data who ends up well, making hopefully it? the self-driving vehicle companies are one of the key winners right that's going to be important uh, for this the other key players are the car companies themselves, right? OEMs, tier one suppliers. Uh, our company is vehicle agnostic. We focus on developing the software 
and also integrating all the sensing into the vehicle to, to basically make it drive autonomously. So do you want but, more vehicle suppliers to come to you? Oh, of course. I mean, why not? I mm. mean, for us, we can take any vehicle and basically, you know, integrate our technology and make it drive. We've built self-driving trucks. We've dr built self-driving sedans. We've built self-driving forklifts. We've, tr we've built all vehicles of, of various sort, scale, and even powertrain as well. So being vehicle agnostic is actually pretty important because the market will dictate what kind of vehicles you actually want to have. And talk to us about your vision now for Optimus. We, we know that you've raised money, Series A, November closed, you've got $18 million. You've got, it's more money needed to continue to scale, to continue to see more of these vehicles that we have around us? Well, it's obvious you need to have more money to, to scale, right? Every b major business needs to do that. If you look at the funding that has been uh, raised for a lot of other self-driving companies, there are much more money uh, that's needed to be able to scale. Uh, and that's, that's for sure. But from our point of view, scalability is proven through pilots. Mm -hmm. And once you have that, it's very easy to build up the capital that you need to do this. So you don't need uh, any more VC money? Well, I think that there's going to be the need for more money always. Uh, whether it's institutional, whether it's strategic uh, funding, uh, it's all part of the whole uh, ability to be able to scale, right? And once you have, a, a, I would say, a minimal viable product, as they always say, you're able to then be able to... Uh, seek the right capital that you need in order to scale. And for us, we think we have a very scalable product because we're not only vehicle agnostic, but the kind of environments that we have are also everywhere you see in the United States, everywhere that you see in the internationally as well. Every city has a problem with first and last mile. Every community has ch challenges with congestion. If you can solve those through one example, the whole world can see it, and then you can, of course, export that throughout. Smarter cities here to come. Thank you very much indeed. It was wonderful. You're hosting us here. Thank you for that as well. Ryan Chin, CEO of Optimus Ride. Meanwhile, shares of Cisco are falling in after-hours trading. This after third quarter revenue came in at $12.5 billion. That's versus estimates of $14.4 billion. Earnings per share were $0.56 cents versus estimates of $0.65. Cents. Now, Cisco also gave an upbeat forecast for fiscal fourth quarter sales, a signal of healthy demand for equipment and software that runs the Internet and corporate networks. For some context, Cisco shares are still, though, up 18% this year. In other earnings news, China's most popular social network, Tencent, posted quarterly earnings that beat estimates. Net income jumped 61%, and the number of users exceeded a billion for the first time. Tencent owns the giant WeChat messaging platform. Coming up, he stood before American lawmakers, and now Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg is getting ready to face the music on the other side of the Atlantic. Next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the US on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to a special edition of Bloomberg Technology, live from the Optimus Ride headquarters in Boston. Now, he was grilled for hours before American members of Congress, and now Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg is preparing to head to Europe to answer European lawmakers' questions about how the data of as many as 2.7 million Europeans could have ended up in the hands of the consulting firm Cambridge Analytica. For more, let's turn to San Francisco and Sarah Fry, who of course covers all things Facebook for Bloomberg. And Sarah, you, you surprised by this decision that they will accept Europe's invitation? Well, next week is a very important week in Europe because that's the, the week that GDPR goes into effect, this privacy regulation that's caused Facebook to make a whole bunch of changes to the privacy settings that it has for its users, not just in Europe but around the world. And so Zuckerberg is going at a time when he really needs to be on the good side of this division of government. Interesting. So timing is everything. May the 25th when GDPR, the general data protection rules, come in. What about the FOMO, perhaps, the fear of missing out being felt by the UK politicians? We got some angry tweets. Caroline, that is, that is just such an interesting back and forth. I mean, that committee has been asking Zuckerberg to appear over and over. And yesterday, Zuckerberg, uh, sorry, I should say Facebook, responded to their questions 
at length, but was very evasive about the idea that Zuckerberg would come testify and actually said he has no plans to go to the UK and that they were disappointed in the government that they didn't find Facebook's answers to be sufficient, which I just felt was, was a, a a strange thing for a company that's been under investigation to say that they're disappointed. And then here's a tweet today from that committee. I want to read it out to you. Um, we remain open to Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook giving evidence via video link or in person. Him not appearing before us is not just a snub to the common CMS, but more importantly, a snub to the UK and the millions of Facebook users in the UK who deserve answers. So that pressure is not going away despite Zuckerberg's attempts to smooth things over with the EU, which I should mention is going to happen behind closed doors. Yeah, fascinating what Damien Collins MP has been saying, who leads that particular committee. Uh, Sarah, talk to us also about the news that we're getting, not only from Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook, but also the key whistle whistleblower who drew all of this to attention with regards to Cambridge Analytica and the whole data scandal that ensued. Christopher Wiley, he's been up in front of US politicians this time, and it, and it seems to be revolving around Russia. So. Uh, Wiley in front of Congress today said that it is possible that the Facebook data that was given to Cambridge Analytica could have been shared with Russia in part because it was just so easily accessible. So this story is not going away. Facebook said that there are 200 other apps that they're looking into that could be similar Cambridge Analytica like situations. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Fascinating the reaction from Facebook and from Christopher Wiley today. Great reporting as ever. Sarah Fryer from Bloomberg in San Francisco. Thank you. Now coming up, our exclusive interview with Raytheon CEO Tom Kennedy. We discuss why the company has stayed in the Boston area for decades. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to a special edition of Bloomberg Technology in Boston. Now, Raytheon is a global leader in technology-driven solutions that provides integrated mission systems for critical defense and def non-defense needs. Being a global company with more than 64,000 employees, we asked CEO Tom Kennedy about the firm's decision to remain headquartered in Boston. Numerous universities, you have MIT, you have Harvard, you have Boston University, you have University of Massachusetts, you have Tufts a whole set of uh, universities that provide folks with the technical skills required to, number one, work in industry and business, but also help to develop the next generation systems and solutions that will be able to compete in the uh, mar global marketplace. What are the next generation of systems and solutions? What things are you seeing being built here? At well, the, the whole area of you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and how you apply them to your product solutions is a whole new wave of uh, capability that we are looking at significantly and putting those, those uh, type of products into our you know, our solutions that we provide customers. 3D printing, is that a key focus? 3D printing is, is really, it's uh, additive, we call it additive manufacturing, which opens yeah. up a whole new door for companies and it really relative to their supply chain. Do they build those products within in their company or do they have them done outside? So it's a whole new dilemma in terms of figuring that out. But additive manufacturing is just going to change the way uh, we do manufacturing in the future. And there's also, I think, one of the things that's changed here in terms of technology is for years we thought we were on a linear curve yeah. in terms of technology. One of the aspects was called Moore's Law. Exactly. So every 18 months you double your, your processing speed. In today's world, we're actually really on an exponential curve. And we're right at the knee of that curve right now. And some of the technologies, and you mentioned one, which is uh, additive manufacturing. But we also have machine learning, artificial intelligence. We have something called nanotechnology. And all these technologies are coming together at this, about the same time that are really going to change the, the, the way we live and the way we work yeah. and, uh, and the way we do business in the world in the future. And you as a business leader, how do you ensure that you're ahead of the curve, ahead of the competition, ahead of the startups that are also being Well, we hire here. the best people we can, and those best people are in Boston. <laughs> and we hire them from the best universities there are, and those best universities are in Boston. What about the talent diversity and the pool of talent you have so much focus on the fact that it's yes you need the best talent but you need to ensure that it's the right sort of working environment as well women ethnic minorities how are you focused on that at Raytheon? Well we found that uh, to get the best product development it helps to have diversity of thought mm. and having a diverse team putting those products and solutions together because our customers are diverse 
right? So to be able to provide the right solutions to them, it helps to have a diverse team developing those solutions. The issue that we are facing, and it's not just Raytheon, it's all technology companies, is, is facing is how do you get a diverse workforce in today's environment when there are not a lot of women that are coming out of the universities well with science and technology and engineering degrees. And so that's an area where, the where companies are working to try to drive that solution and to fix that solution. How are you helping drive it? Well, personally, we are heavily involved in science, technology, and engineering and math uh, activities. Uh, for example, one program we've just started up is with the uh, Girl Scouts of America, mm -hmm. and working with them on STEM initiatives and actually a STEM badge so that if they do certain projects, they wind up with a STEM badge and for the uh, Girl Scouts. Where are you finding talent pools coming from? from a regional perspective? I mean, are you finding that China is producing more and more great talent? Are they coming here to study? Are they coming here to then live? Or are you putting parts of your business in other parts of the world to ensure that you can harvest that sort of talent well, we as well? We are a global company. We have uh, folks in the United Kingdom, uh, in London, in Scotland. We have folks in uh, uh, across Europe. Uh, in the Asia Pacific region, we also have uh, we uh, we have a landed company in Australia, Raytheon Australia, and we also have activities in the uh, GCC in the Middle East. So we do have a, uh, a global level of talent around the world, but the United States uh, has the, some of the best universities in the world. In fact, the, m many of our employees worldwide have, have attended universities in the United States, and Boston is a, is a key area where where a lot of the schools provide that background, that talent, capabilities to help any business go to the next level in the global marketplace. How can Boston make sure it remains a number one talent pool for you? Well, I think it needs to ensure that it's business friendly and uh, in, in the city of Boston as it grows, that we continue to work the transportation item issues relative to getting people inside into the city and out of the city, and that we continue to maintain the university structure that provides aff affordable and education, but a high level education, especially in the sciences. You talked about IP previously and, and, and the fact that that's sometimes a concern for us about cybersecurity and area protection. Do you feel that the focus at the moment in terms of the US on, on IP, particularly versus China, is the right way to be looking at it? Is that helping the economy as well? Well, I think we have to protect our IP. And if yeah. to be able to run a business, you must be able to protect your inventions, your new technologies, to be able to go and compete in the international marketplace. If folks are stealing that IP and replicating that technology in other places and undermining you in a global marketplace, it just totally impacts the business. Mm. And when you say, of course, your presence in GCC in the Middle East, I mean, a topic of conversation at the moment has to be geopolitical risks. How does that affect you as a business? Well, we operate worldwide. Uh, every day I get up, I'm constantly uh, becoming a, a geopolitical uh, expert relative to what's going on in the world, because what goes around in the world impacts me and day-to-day day, and day -day business activities. That was our conversation with Raytheon CEO Tom Kennedy. Now coming up, we'll talk about the path forward for self-driving cars in Boston and around the world. We'll cover the ways to improve vehicle safety for autonomous technology. And later, just how can technology help improve the transportation infrastructure of a city? We'll discuss with Boston's Transportation Commissioner. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde, and we are broadcasting in Boston all this week, and have set up shop today in Optimus Rides headquarters. And most of this hour, we've been discussing what's emerging as one of the fastest growing industries in tech, autonomous driving. Many in the field now predict that the majority of cars on the road will have self-driving capabilities sooner than you think. So will the roads be safer if humans are no longer behind the wheel? For more, let's bring in John Leonard, He's Toyota Research Institute VP of Auto automated driving research. You're on sabbatical from MIT. Yes. Wonderful to have you here, John. And so will humans not be inter interacting with vehicles or at the moment you're working with a dual sort of project? So, uh, yeah, I'm an MIT professor and I've been involved in this technology my whole career. And I have this amazing opportunity now to work with Toyota, who chose Boston as one of the places for its new Toyota Research Institute laboratories for the access to talent and the whole sort of technology network here. And so we're pursuing a dual strategy, something we call chauffeur, which is full self-driving, also called level four, but also something called guardian, which is uh, we have a human driven car, but an autonomy system running in the background in parallel, ready to jump in to take over to try to improve safety. So does that mean when it will just be a step towards fully autonomous vehicles? Will, we, will the interim period be that there will always be a human behind the wheel with access to that wheel? 
It's, it's a great question. I think there are many paths. Um, I think self-driving is the space race in tech of the 21st century. We have the traditional OEMs, the tier one suppliers, the small startups like Optimus Ride and the big tech giants like Apple and Google and Intel and Nvidia. And um, there are many different paths, but it's, it's clear to me that we're gonna have human cars for a long time. The average car's on the road at least 10 years. And so the interaction of humans and machines opens up a whole new space of interesting challenges. Does it, do the human inherently make them less safe? If it... That's a great question. Um, a lot of accidents are indeed due to human error, but human skills are actually very complementary to AI technology. Humans are bad at sort of monitoring an autonomous system for a very long time. Uh -huh. If a car can do 99% of the job, but you have to be ready to jump in at a moment's notice for 1% of the job, that's actually quite hard. Whereas autonomy can be ever vigilant and can help the human in say a, an unexpected situation. Like how? So for example, um, I think a lot about making left turns across traffic. I have a teenager that's learning how to drive here in the Boston area. And uh, we have some really challenging intersections here. Yeah. And that whole question of how you get the experience to make decisions, uh, make solving a kind of physics problem, is it safe for me to go, but also a social interaction problem. A lot of times you have to wave at other drivers to sort of let them let you in. Those are actually really challenging problems for machines to solve. So how will the AI inherently nudge the human right. to say, okay, now you need to step in, right. and stop drinking your coffee, stop listening to the right. music, you need to, well, well, okay. Well, to me, I, I, I believe that driving is something we should be paying attention all the time. It should be our number one job. But mm -hmm. uh, current technology like automatic emergency braking, the car can step in and, and sort of slow the vehicle down. But imagine a more uh, broader set of capabilities where the car might take evasive maneuvers. If you could stay on the road, don't hit things, don't get hit, you, you could probably dramatically reduce accidents. And so if going back to that left turn across traffic incidents, if say a teenager or an elderly driver went to go when there was a car coming, perhaps the view is occluded, the autonomy might step in and prevent them from going. It might have the sort of uh, perceptual awareness, the sort of 360 degree view that can help the human who's sort of looking back and forth trying to say, is it safe to go or not? And so what's your view in terms of when that will become ready and it in use on the road, and then when we will have full autonomy. Yeah, so that whole question of when is so hard to answer, <laughs> and I, I tend to be more on the contrarian side. I think it's gonna be longer than a lot of other folks think, but from a Toyota perspective, we're pursuing all product sort of opportunities, and, and, and I can't say like any specific dates. What I would say, it's not so much a question of when for full autonomy, but where. There are limited deployments happening, for example, Waymo in Arizona, these sort of trials here in South Boston, and so technology might be, and some folks have commented on the uh, some, some journalists that it's a bit like think of an early cell phone coverage map where initially the cell phones might only work in big cities or in mm. selected areas and over time they sort of grew to cover larger areas. Uh, autonomy might sort of percolate slowly out of certain urban centers and then and then have broader coverage but it might take a lot longer than people think. Is regulation the hurdle here? Uh, I, I think regulation is an issue um, especially if you know th there but I'm not really an expert on regulation, I'm just purely the technology aspects, things like interacting with police officers and traffic cops and dealing with the snow that we get here in Boston and across much of the country. Uh, there are a lot of technical challenges, road construction. So there's plenty of technological challenges I think that still need a lot of work if we're gonna sort of achieve the equivalent of the 2018 cell phone coverage map of the US for full autonomy. It could take a very long time. What about the infrastructure, 5G? So. Uh, so vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle and vehicle -to infrastructure communications are not part of our current mandate at Toyota Research Institute. We're thinking more about machine learning, artificial intelligence, and harvesting data and interacting with people. But Toyota has recently announced that it's introducing the DSRC communication chips in all its vehicles soon. And, and as a technologist, I want every tool in the toolbox. And so I'm actually, I think if cars can communicate with each other and help each other out of tricky situations, maybe we can get a sort of social good will emerge that perhaps unfriendly Boston drivers, their cars will be friendly to one another and they will help each other navigate these challenging roads around here. Friendly cars to each other. We all hope for social good. It's great to have you here. Thank you very much indeed for talking us through all the technological challenges. John Leonard with the Toyota Research Institute.
Now, the United States Senate has voted to restore the Obama-era net neutrality rules. The vote was 52 to 47 in favor of reinstating the rules that would keep internet service providers from throttling speeds and favoring their own content. Now, the President Trump appointed FCC voted 3 to 2 along party lines to roll back the regulations late last year. However, Wednesday's victory for net neutrality proponents may be short-lived. The House is not expected to take up the vote, and even if they did pass the bill, it is expected that President Trump would veto it. Now coming up, what you know to know about Piaggio, a Boston-based startup that is shaping the future of transportation, not on the road, but the sidewalk. And later in the show, it's not just a plane, it's a car. We speak to the CEO looking to take you from the tarmac to the clouds. This is Bloomberg. In the race for the future of transportation, one startup is focusing not on driving, but on walking. Piaggio Fast Forward, a Boston-based division of the Italian company best known for the Vespa scooters, is developing a robot to carry cargo and follow a pedestrian. Bloomberg's Anne Mosti reports. Meet Gita, a robot designed to identify and follow you. Gita is a personal mobility assistant, has a cargo bay, which holds approximately 45 pounds of goods. Gita was created by Jeff Schnapp, CEO of Piaggio Fast Forward. Our goal in designing these vehicles is really to enable pedestrian-based lifestyles, to allow people to walk more, better, further, and faster. With Gita, you throw those goods into a vehicle and just start walking. The company is a Boston-based subsidiary of Piaggio, the Italian creator of Vespa motor scooters. Our brief was really to invent something new, like a vehicle you haven't seen, <laughs> but that could be the equivalent, uh, maybe, of a kind of disruptive vehicle like the Vespa was in 1946 for 2018. And according to Snap, the target consumer is similar too. We're looking at a consumer buyer as our ultimate target, the kind of buyer who would want to have a Vespa motor scooter. Gita's price tag to start around $3,000. One of the defining features of the way cities are being redesigned and have been redesigned over the course of the last 30 years is the growing importance of pedestrian-only areas, areas that are not accessible to cars and trucks. And uh, we think that's a trend that is going to expand over the course of the coming century. And Gita is a vehicle that is designed precisely for those environments. Piaggio Fast Forward has a fleet of prototype vehicles and expects to complete its first generation production model this summer. Schnapp predicts 10,000 vehicles will hit the market by early 2019. We also think that uh, Gita will have uh, extremely useful applications in suburban type environments as well, where people sometimes would like to walk, but the distances are just sufficiently you know, great as to create a sort of resistance, or they often involve moving around with kids, for example. Um, and so having fleets of these kinds of vehicles could also allow people not to have to reach for the keys to the car. Gita's competition is limited, but there is a growing number of companies working on delivery robots. And not everyone is on board. San Francisco banned those bots on sidewalks last year. They're only competition in as much as we're both interested in sidewalks. But the reality is that their robots are designed in a very different way for a very different um, set of use scenarios than ours are. Our motto at Piaggio Vesford is autonomy for humans. <laughs> and what autonomy for humans means to us is um, a focus on human-centered design. In other words, creating vehicles that don't replace human functionalities, but expand them. And the company is expanding, too. I think currently around uh, 35 uh, full-time employees. We're expecting by the end of the current calendar year to be somewhere closer to 100 uh, total. So we're in a very active growth phase right now as we move towards um, essentially moving you know, Gita into, into production and then out onto the market. Ann Moss to Bloomberg, Boston. You want one? 
Well, let's cover a little bit more the bigger picture of initiatives for roads and public transportation in Boston. We caught up with the city's transportation commissioner, Gina Fiendaka. We first discussed, well, how tech industry is helping to improve transportation throughout Boston. We have a great environment for testing new technology and for identifying really cutting edge ways of, of enhancing mobility. We released Go Boston 2030, which was a cutting edge uh, mobility plan for a long term growth for the city of Boston. And a hallmark of that was really how we engage the public in helping to form what the future of mobility will look like. Paint the picture. What will it look like? What are the, sure. what are the techs? What's the technology underlying it? Uh, a lot of the technology is around connecting points of, of mobility and using data in a really smart way to help us inform how we shape transportation policy decisions, whether it's around enhancing our public transit system or utilizing adaptive technology to communicate with vehicles and with uh, mass transit vehicles, buses and, and uh, trains and certainly autonomous vehicles are part of the mix. Talk to us about autonomous vehicles because the self-driving car testing program has been put on hold since we saw that tragic event with an Uber killing a, a woman in the, in, uh, back in March. Where do you see that coming back online? Is it still the right decision to be having it on hold? Well, sure. In Boston, we did uh, take a pause for testing here, and we have two, three companies that are actively testing with us now um, in this seaport location where we are. And so after that incident, we paused testing. We regrouped with our partners who are testing, and we really made sure that they're adhering to some of the safety protocols. So we actually have resumed testing, um, and they're really a great partners for us in terms of being transparent about what those testing protocols are and making sure that as we roll them out we're forward thinking and safety is our number one priority. What sort of key elements did you want to see to the enhancement in safety? Sure, we wanted to make sure that they're adhering to the protocol that we've established, which is that there's a safety driver in the vehicle at all times as well as sort of a systems person so that's da gathering data on how the system is performing. So there are two separate functions and they're always making sure that that vehicle is operating in a safe mode, um, adhering to all of the normal uh, driving protocols, whether it's um, signal notification, and adhering to uh, speed limits and crosswalks and things like that. Uh, so they uh, are required to submit reports to us on a regular basis, which is all made available to the public. Um, all of our testing protocols are out on the city's website. All the information that you want to know about how Boston's taking the lead on this is out there on our website. Why do you want Boston to take the lead on it? It's important to really make sure that your mobility systems are not only functioning optimally for current conditions, but also take into consideration what your future landscape will look like. And in Boston, we have great partners here with our universities, uh, Newtonomy and Optimus and Aptiv, and we have a, a sort of a very fertile environment for encouraging that sort of creativity. What about the environment for bike sharing? This is a, an area that I know you signed a program um, with Blue Cross. It's interesting in other cities we're seeing a rampant rise in dockless bike sharing and it, it can be efficient but it also can cause chaos in many ways. How are you managing that yourself? Any program that improves the mobility options for folks, whether it's riding a bicycle, walking, taking public transit, is a terrific thing. Um, certainly, we've hired an active transportation director a couple of years ago in Boston, um, and she's responsible not only for our bike program, but also all things active transportation and ensuring that um, we incorporate mobility options into our street design. Now, that said, we have a great program with Blue Cross Blue Shield, which sponsors our, our bike share system, and that's a docked system, and we've been really thoughtful and strategic about how we provide opportunities for bike share in all of our neighborhoods and building out a network so that folks in downtown Boston can visit our outlying neighborhoods in Mattapan and Roxbury and Dorchester, and that those folks have access to, to bike share. That was Transportation Commissioner Gina Fiendaka there.
Coming up, taking it to the skies. Just how soon will it be from when you pull out of your garage and wind up in the clouds? We find out next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to a special edition of Bloomberg Technology live from the Optimus Ride headquarters in Boston. And speaking of rides, well, there's one bit of future tech we've been promised for years, and our next guest is racing to make it a reality the flying car. That's what Woburn, Massachusetts startup Terrafugia is working on. Are they flying cars? Are they drivable planes? How will they be regulated? And how soon will it be before the rubber no longer meets the only the road? To answer that and more, I'd like to welcome Chris Geran, CEO of Terrafugia. Welcome. Thank you. So, first flying car to the market, you're still aiming for that? We should be delivering our first products to customers the middle of next year. And what are they like? Are they a, a driving plane or are they a flying car? Yes, that, that particular product uh, has wings that fold up. So you park it in your garage, you drive it to the nearby airport, to unfold the wings in less than a minute and take off to wherever you want to go. How do you ensure that the, the pilot is harnessing safety, is focused on, on safety going forward? Because this is a whole new area that needs to be regulated. It's interesting. Because we're a flying car, we have to meet the regulations of both the National Highway uh, Safety Transportation Group mm -hmm. as well as the FAA. So the, the person who's driving obviously has to be a licensed uh, driver in the, in the U.S. And when they're behind the, the stick, when they're flying the, the vehicle, they have to be a licensed pilot with the FAA. Mm -hmm. But we build in the safety aspects, and it's a bit of a challenge for us because we need to have all of the automobile safety aspects, mm -hmm. seat belts, airbags, uh, crumple zones, right? All of that stuff is part of our testing process and a requirement for us. And when you're in the air, we need all the things to go with that, including a parachute. So if there's uh, trouble in the air, the last resort is to pull the parachute and come straight down and land safely. So. How are the regulators about all of this? Is it easy to negotiate with them? Are they looking forward thinking? You know, we, we were one of the first to be in this space, and we'll certainly be the first to have a uh, roadable aircraft, right, a flying car that's in production. So there were some challenges along the way. And in some cases, we need to, to get the regulators to compromise. For instance, uh, an aircraft windshield is an acrylic uh, piece of equipment, mm -hmm. and an automobile one is safety glass. But if a bird strikes the windshield when you're in flight, the safety glass makes it so that you can't see. Mm. So we needed to have the FAA and the, the highway the safety folks compromise to allow us to use an aircraft quality windshield in, a, in an automobile. And they did. We're seeing pictures uh, of the vehicles that you've been making. The, the transition, I believe, is the one that's coming on tap as soon as next year. But what about the TFX aircraft? This was one that goes far faster, far further. How does that change the whole rules of transportation? So in that case, it's a, it's a much different design. Uh, and in fact, for that design, it's a, a tilt rotor kind of vehicle. Mm -hmm. right? So it, it's a, a different development. It's actually much more challenging to, yeah. to come up with that one. And, and honestly, what we've done now is we've, uh, we've decided that the second product we will produce is going to be an urban air mobility vehicle, a flying taxi in effect. Right? Okay. So we've sort of put the TFX, the, the small tilt rotor vehicle, on the back burner for the time being because we see a real market opportunity with, with urban air mobility. And, and this is having, you've just been to the Elevate event that Uber right. put on. I mean, this is a, getting a crowded space, no? It is. Um, I think we're in a unique position. Right? Uh, at the top of, the, of this space are Boeing and Airbus. Yeah. And they're clearly excited and interested that this is likely to be a new market for them. So they've actually acquired some of the, the startup companies and they're fully funding them. At the other end of the spectrum, there's lots of small companies that are startups that struggle for funding every year. We find ourselves in a different situation, right? We're now owned by the largest manufacturer of cars in China who are fully funding us, but we don't have the other aspects of the big companies like Boeing and Airbus. So we're, we're very agile. So you can be nimble, Geely, the Chinese company putting the money in, how much money does this take? It's in the hundreds of millions of dollars in order to get you 
fully developed into, into this process. Right? What about autonomous? Where, when is that a focus? So, so it, it's different for cars and, and uh, aircraft, but uh, in some aspects similar. Both have been under development for a long time. Uh, so what we're doing is we're actually taking an approach that says we're going to start with pilots in the air vehicle, mm -hmm. right? Something that the FAA can certify immediately, that we could put into production and into the airspace right now. But with the aspects of autonomy in the vehicles so that you can start to demonstrate that capability. And when the FAA is ready to accept that or the other, other agencies around the world, then we can take the pilot out. So in order to get into the market, we're taking a bit of a different approach. Our next, our urban taxi is a four passenger and one pilot vehicle. And when we're ready, we'll pull the pilot. A date for when that will come on tap? We'll be flying the first prototype next year. And we'll, we're looking to deliver around 2023. A busy man, Chris Duran. Thank you very much for making the time for us. CEO of Terrafugia joining us. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology live from Boston. Tomorrow we will be at the historic Fenway Park speaking with none other than Boston Red Sox president Sam Kennedy. We'll also be speaking to DraftKings CEO Jason Robbins and Boston Celtics president Rich Gotham. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>